thanks everyone for being with us today. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, I'm Tanya Harry, I'm Disha's Executive Director. I'm so pleased um, to welcome you to the first panel of our two-part Gaza Policy Forum. Um, so at the end of 2018, we gathered about 100 Palestinian, Israeli, and foreign stakeholders in Jerusalem in person to discuss the situation in Gaza and make policy recommendations to all the actors with influence over Palestinian lives in the Strip. Um, the upside to us not being able to meet in person is that residents of Gaza and the West Bank actually don't need a permit this time to attend the forum. Um, and we're grateful to host this gathering even in these unfortunate circumstances. Um, but like in 2018, we will be compiling and publishing the policy recommendations made today by both our panelists and our guests. Our goal really is to um, both take stock of where we're at, but also define what must be done to enhance the protection of rights and well-being in the Strip. The recommendations will be published, but without attribution to any specific speaker. Today's panel is going to explore the isolation of Gaza in the context of Israel's annexationist vision for the West Bank. Um, and I'm really pleased to welcome three expert women panelists. Abir al Masri is the research assistant for Gaza at Human Rights Watch and a native of Gaza City. She's worked as an interpreter for journalists and in foreign and local NGOs in the Strip. Dr. Yael Berda is an Israeli lawyer, assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the Hebrew University, and currently a visiting lecturer in sociology at Harvard University. Her research explores the intersections of law, race, bureaucracy, and the state. Dr. Natalie Tochi is the director of the Instituto Affari Internazionali in Rome and an honorary professor at the University of Tübingen. She is currently special advisor to the EU High Representative for Foreign Policy and also advised his predecessor. So the webinar is going to begin with a moderated discussion with our panelists, which will be recorded and it'll be publicized after the event. Um, we're not live right now. Uh, we will then open the floor up for an off the record conversation, which will not be recorded or publicized. So please are with us through this kind of experimentation um, we would like to have participation from our audience as much as we can in these weird times. Um, this is a webinar, so the video function is going to be disabled for all attendees. So if nothing is wrong, don't worry. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions at any time for the panelists. And you'll also be able to ask a question via audio in the Q&A section of the event by raising your hand. If you have any tech So speak for a panel moderated by me about the humanitarian and economic situation, particularly in light of recent development. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over the floor to Beth Oppenheim, Bisha's Director of International Relations. She's going to be moderating today's panel. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tanya. So until the end of August, Gaza had been shielded from the spread of the coronavirus, which was largely because of these very stringent restrictions on movement. But very concerningly, as of the last few weeks, we now have 1,024 cases diagnosed inside the community in Gaza. And obviously that could be absolutely catastrophic because of Gaza's very dense population. And of course, because of the infrastructure that's already been decimated by many years of closure policy by Israel and also conflict with Israel and of course made worse by the internal Palestinian political split. Now, one of the main takeaways of the last Gaza policy forum was that the Strip's so-called humanitarian crisis is actually man-made. And so short-term easing measures like increasing aid or even larger scale development projects can only ever be a sticking plaster because they don't address the fundamental issues, underlying issues, which are of course political. So we're very lucky to have three panelists today who work across civil society, academia, and diplomacy, and some of them in all three. And we want to have a discussion relying on their insight about ways forward out of the deadlock that the region, and that specifically Gaza, find themselves in. 
And we want to really examine the motivations of the different actors involved and the political dynamics at play that are feeding into these cycles. And as Tanya mentioned, next week at the same time, we're going to dive in deeper into the economic and humanitarian situation. But today we're really trying to broaden out um, and look at the kind of political perspective also. So as many of you will be aware, of course, Israel maintains very comprehensive control over the Gaza Strip. Despite this myth of disengagement when Israel pulled its settlers and its army out in 2005. And that engenders a really strong obligation on Israel's part to protect basic rights and living conditions in Gaza. And that's, you know, grounded in international law. But time and again, we see Israel denying that responsibility and doing exactly the opposite. during a global pandemic by implementing a number of restrictive measures. So once more, Gaza's residents were left in the dark without reliable electricity, without access to essential goods, and without the ability to move freely. And we've now seen that things have returned to the status quo. But of course, Gaza's status quo still means extremely stringent movement restrictions, an economy that's suffering, very weak infrastructure and this continued isolation of Gaza. So Israel is very deliberately cutting off Gaza from the West Bank by keeping 2 million Palestinians out of Israel's demographic equation. And so while the fanfare about formal annexation may have subsided, Israel very much continues to strengthen its grip over the West Bank by expanding the settlements and of course continuing with its movement policy of preventing Gaza residents from traveling or, or definitely moving to the West Bank. And that's something Gishal's researched in depth and you can read about in our recent paper. So Palestinians of course are divided both geographically and also politically. And that has very profound implications for the delivery of services on the ground. And it also prevents a unified Palestinian for the future, Palestinian vision for the future from emerging. Meanwhile, the international community has looked on, you know, fatigued by years of dead-end diplomacy and, of course, now very preoccupied with the global health crisis. And we see that many international actors, really what drives their policy is interest, national interest often, um, or supranational interest, um, not only with this conflict, but many others. And so for many actors, their economic and defense ties with Israel trump the need to protect international law and human rights. And we saw this very clearly emerge this spring was a real litmus test, which was when Israel threatened to formally annex parts of the West Bank. The international community found itself in a bind, unwilling on the one hand to sacrifice the bilateral relationship with Israel, but also not quite ready to cast off international law entirely. So the question is, where will this leave Gaza? So I'm delighted to be able to welcome our panel who have real depth of expertise on these issues. And I'm going to be asking each of the speakers to address a few questions, and then we're going to have a moderated question and answer discussion starting around five. So I'm going to turn first to Abir. Um, Abir, travel to and from Gaza is at a virtual standstill because of the coronavirus restrictions and, you know, um, made worse by the suspension of PA coordination. I just wonder if you could outline for us what conditions are like inside Gaza at the moment. And even before the pandemic, what is life in, like in Gaza under so-called normal circumstances? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Beth. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, actually, as you mentioned, as you just mentioned, um, Israel, imposed, Israel imposed a severe restriction of freedom of movement and the freedom of movement of people and goods into and out of Gaza. Uh, uh, so it is a general. It is a general travel ban. Um, what Israel? It is a general tra travel ban that Israel, that which Israel actually it excludes. It says like um, for just exceptional humanitarian cases, the way that always the way that Israel actually. And um, so you can imagine that situation is already uh, is already tough even for the pandemic. It is already a difficult situation even, even before the suspension of the security coordination. Uh, and also even it is when Israel actually, as, as you may know, uh, last, last month Israel imposed um, some punitive measures on Gaza as well. 
um, to balance the flaming balance and stuff and stuff like that uh, uh, on Gaza as as punitive measures. Um, so it is in, in, one of of the actually one of these uh, restrictions were blocking entry to fuel. It is already dark in Gaza. Uh, you know, it is now. It is. It's a very very uh, Abir, can with, I just suggest uh, you turn off your video? I think it will make your audio quality better. Just just use it, the audio and turn off video. Great. Is it is it better now? Yeah, please continue. Thanks, Abir. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, yeah, it is a really difficult situation. And even when Israel actually, uh, last month, when they, when they imposed um, the punitive measures on Gaza, including looking entry to fuel, just like making the situation getting worse. And it is already, it is already a tough situation, even, with, even with, with eight hours of electricity. This is not the normal reality that we want here in Gaza. It is just what the reality that we have, and we have to accept it because we don't have uh, other choice. Um, as as I said, it is a critical situation here with the um, with the with with the with the situation of the the pandemic. Um, so uh, actually, since COVID nineteen is a global issue, I think maybe the world can imagine uh, how imagine if they if they have to. Um, uh, to experience about three or six hours a day during their lockdown. Actually, several months ago, um, I, I got stuck in Amman. Uh, it was during the, um, the beginning of the crisis, of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, it was really tough experience for everyone, for me and for everyone. However, I had access to 20 hours, 20 hours of electricity. I had access to water. In, in Jordan, there is a good health uh, system uh, for for COVID nineteen cases, uh, and also the most important thing, there is no constant fear about imminent escalation. There, there are no uh, Israeli drones hovering hovering actually above our head above our heads just to remind us there will be escalation soon and there will be death soon and killing. So the situation was the situation actually is is tough and it's getting worse, and it is psychologically and physically harming people. Um, for the security coordination, um, a lot of patients actually, it, it, it is impacting people. You, you can imagine that it is now uh, put, uh, just like put lives on, on hold. Um, so a lot of patients actually, um, they fear for they are lives. Uh, uh, they have concern about the possibility to get um, to get an exit permit to travel in order to get the treatment. However, it's not it's not actually that easy. Even before the suspension of the security coordination, uh, it is always tough. But what is the difference? The difference that it is um, before the suspension, there was a chance uh, that there is a, a chance for people that they can struggle, and this struggle. Um, might take month or or maybe a year. Um, a couple actually, a couple of months ago, I interviewed uh, a father who um, a father um, about his actually he told me about his son who has cancer. He was describing me the complicated process. He described it like uh, their struggle is just like uh, it's it's just a game. Uh, you may win or you may lose with your life. So it's just like ongoing, it is ongoing struggle, but now uh, it is getting uh, worse with the pandemic. And now people, uh, patients, people have concern about not only patients, people, but also as part of my work on people with disabilities, there are also some cases that they are waiting uh, to, um, they are waiting to get back. They are, they are hoping that they will be able to um, to obtain to to submit permits so they can go to the West Bank or Jerusalem in order to uh, get, um, for example, artificial limb because it is difficult to 
it is always difficult to have an expert here to do it properly for them. So how do people perceive the PA decision? Is there kind of support behind the idea of resisting annexation or is there, um, you know, a lot of criticism towards this approach because, as you said, of the human cost to, to this decision? Actually, they see, it, they see it as, they don't see it that it will, it will be a permanent decision. Uh, it, they see it as a way to pressure Israel uh, regarding the, the decision on annexation. So I, most people are just like waiting that this, they, are, they, are, they imagine that this will be for a short time and it will, it will be ended soon. I also just wanted to ask you a bit about how you experience the separation policy in your own life and also in your work for Human Rights Watch, because of course that greatly impacts the ability to travel between Gaza and the West Bank. I'm talking now in normal non-coronavirus times. So how does the separation policy actually impinge on, on your own life and your work for Human Rights Watch? Um, yeah, so as you may know, I work uh, with, my, uh, with my team, with Israel Palestine team. Uh, but uh, because of that policy, we are separated. Um, I was able to meet them in person uh, after working with them, after two years working with HRW uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so it, the closure actually is impacting our work. Uh, so, um, for example, our team is not able to come to Gaza, so they can, uh, we can work together in the field. Uh, we can develop and to develop uh, um, uh, the relationship with our local partners, with the government, um, and also uh, it. Um, and also to be with them, to be with them, to do also the research in the West Bank with my colleagues. There were times actually in, in Gaza, I really needed to have a company, to have my teams with me, particularly uh, during the last escalation. Uh, the idea that I have, I have my team with me or I have some, someone with me, it is comforting. Uh, of course, I'm having actually the support remotely from them, uh, but uh, it is always it is always better to 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 see them in person, especially after being able to meet them. Um, two years ago, uh, I was able to meet. I was able to go to to Jerusalem for the first time, and I just realized how life is just like so easy. Uh, I was able to to meet them and also work with my, one of my colleague and uh, and. Uh, uh, we did some field work in Ramallah, and that was really great uh, feeling. Uh, and also, it took actually it took more than three decades to make the one-hour trip to Jerusalem. And I didn't realize that it's that easy because I just like I came, I made it to the Erz crossing, and my team were waiting for me in the other side. Uh, and one other thing, actually, earlier this year, I managed to um, I managed to go to Ramallah. And I just realized how life is so nice without occupation and closure. I managed to get a permit and I did, I, I go straight from Gaza, from Gaza to, to the West Bank and did uh, actually an interview there. Uh, this is my first and unique experience. Thank you. And 70% of Gaza's population is under 30. And I'm interested to know how do young people in Gaza view the situation in the Strip and view their own prospects? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I am um, the desperation in each quarter in Gaza uh, and the, like in the taxi, the groceries, uh, and also in the facility where people are standing in very long lines uh, where they are trying to uh, submit a permit in order to travel through Rafah crossing. After 13 years, people, including young people, they, are, they, they find themselves uh, packed in uh, uh, an employment rate with 80 percent, uh, 80 percent people rely on humanitarian aid. Um, 
and also with no sign that this situation will be changed. It is, it is really a tough situation for them. Here in Gaza, there are many, many people that I know in person that they are very wonderful, uh, um, but they don't actually have the chance um, that to not travel for scholarship, uh, and they keep, they keep trying. Uh, and also artists who need to participate in, in a certain gallery. Um, the closure actually impacting their psychological uh, situation and condition. Some of them actually, uh, they are trying to uh, for example, to have like online, online business, uh, or online uh, uh, employment or something like that. But uh, they are hoping that one day that they can travel freely, that they can see other people, they can see other cultures, that they can talk to people outside Gaza that we are normal people, so the other people can know about us. They can, uh, we can like, also they can know, know about other cultures because uh, there is nothing like freedom of movement. From my own experience, I just remember a couple of years ago, two years ago, or three years ago, it was my first time to leave Gaza. And I remember uh, I, made it, uh, I made it to Amman. And it, was, uh, it was really amazing feeling to feel that I'm in a big street and I can, take, I can get a taxi and go to a very long distances without any sign that can stop me to tell me that it is border and you have uh, to stop here. Uh, there is nothing like freedom of movement. There is nothing like being free and being the one to decide when or, uh, or when to, or where to go. Thank you so much, Abir. That was um, really, really powerful. I really appreciate hearing from you. I'm going to move now to Yael if you're there. Um, so, your work explores the ways in which mundane, the mundanity of you know, bureaucracy and the permit regime shapes political outcomes. And you've explored this in detail in your book, Living Emergency, which is about the West Bank. But you've also written and spoken about how that same logic applies in Gaza. So I'm interested to know exactly how does the permit regime service the goals of the Israeli government? Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you so much, Abil, for, for sharing um, your experience. I think that that last those last two minutes where you described being able to take the taxi, um, they're so important for understanding how, um, what does it mean not to have freedom of movement and how it impacts your life? And I just want to start by saying that, you know, 2020 maybe is the year uh, where Palestinian experience goes global. And for the first time, people get a glimpse, a very, very different glimpse, right? It comes from a, a, f a whole different thing about what is closure? What is lockdown? What is when you have no control over your own movement in your life? And I think all over the, the world, people are asking them, shocked by the fact that they couldn't make a choice to see their family. They couldn't make a choice to go out of their houses. They couldn't make a choice to go to work. Um, they had to find solutions for things that they never imagined they would need to, and all because of mobility restrictions. And so I think in some way, um, it might be possible to better, to, to catch, capture the attention of ears and eyes that have been closed to the plight of Gazans um, who are under siege for so many years without those basic freedoms of making that choice of being able to move. Now, um, so my work on the West Bank, um, I think the West Bank and Gaza are very different because, but it, but it is part of what I call a repertoire of legal spatial measures that their purpose is to control population through separation, surveillance, and monitoring. Now, you will, what, what happens is, is that there, the justification for these measures is always security. The reason for these measures is always going to be security. And then, um, 
And then there's that, that the conversation stops being about why these measures are, are taking place and it starts being about the technicalities. And so I wanna move for one second from, uh, from uh, the Israeli government apparatus, I call it the bureaucracy of the occupation. It is not just the civil administration and the coordination of government actions in the territories. The bureaucracy of the occupation includes the ministries of defense, um, the, the ministries of economy, the employment organizations, um, and also um, uh, Israeli corporations and, and economic organizations that all take part in uh, the regulation of movement of Palestinians for political and economic reasons. So it is not just, you know, talking to um, uh, DCOs or talking to COGAT. It, I think thinking of it as, as a field where you have many different agents and many different organizations with different interests is helpful for understanding how it works and why it's so contradictory at times. It's very hard to understand. I mean, it's not hard for people on the ground, right? Like Abir says, people stand in wait in lines for years to be able to get a permit. So at the, at the end, you know, the, the end user of the bureaucracy, the, the situation is quite clear. Um, but anyone trying to understand what, what the purpose or goal of the structure is can become very, very confused, uh, if not very cynical. So let's talk, I wanna talk a little bit about what happens when everything is geared toward the security. And um, in order to have the conversation with the Israeli bodies, one must accept that premise of security and never challenge it, right? I mean, uh, probably anyone who's been uh, in human rights organizations or diplomats knows this. You can get through to people if you're gonna be talking about economic policies, if you're gonna be talking about um, humanitarian issues, but you have to, take you know stay out of the political structure and the questioning of security measures um, as methods of separation control um, and atomization because i think atomization is a very very strong part of um, what the permit the outcome of the permit regime um, atomization meaning keeping people separate what abil was describing and not being able to work with her colleagues is it, what, what happens with atomization is that people cannot organize. They cannot organize social structures. They cannot organize political structures. They cannot make, make plans to make changes that are necessary to build your city, to build your community, to build your life. And that atomization, if anyone asks me what the goal of the permit regime is, is to atomize Palestinian society to the point that it cannot um, uh, create that, that social and political coagulation to form its governing bodies and its economic bodies and cultural bodies. And actually, and actually um, that's a goal that has not worked. And I know that people, um, you know, you know, it's hard to, to, to look on the bright side, but even with coronavirus and the, the, and the um, um, pretty very impressive response of Palestinian Authority and civil society in the West Bank and impressive response, I think, in Gaza as well. Um, you actually see how, it's actually quite incredible how under these conditions of perpetual atomization and separation and segregation, people are actually managing to make things work. And that, you know, that kind of says to you, look at this. I mean, literally there is the most sophisticated population management on, system on the planet that has been ongoing for decades and a siege that has been going on fully for a decade. And yet there are these possibilities for social and political organizations. And so I, that I think in that way, and, and you know, I'm just gonna jump to recommendations, stop me if you wanna talk about something else. But I think that one of the things that people can do, both Israel, pro-democracy Israelis and, um, and uh, human rights organizations and the international community can do is stop agreeing to have the technical conversation about economics 
or about humanitarian aid or about, or about health uh, policy or about quotas and have the conversation that needs to be had about political solutions that take into account that yes, Israel is fully responsible for the lives of 2 million people in Gaza, that Gaza is not on the moon, it is not separate from the West Bank. There is no possible solution for um, the situation in Israel-Palestine as a whole without Gaza. Yes, the disengagement was basically possibly one of the worst decisions that the that, that Israel's that Israeli government and society ever made. <laughs> and I think that it that that there's a realization of that also um, uh, within Israeli society, but that's not the point right now. Um, I do think that that one thing that will enable um, change is to view Gaza um, first center it and view it as not separate not only not separate from the West Bank but also not separate from from Israel I mean there we have this one system it's a condition it's it's there's one government that controls the entire territory we have to see it for what it is regardless of what kind of solution one wants to see, right? Regardless of the solution that you wanna see, we need to be able to look at the situation, see it for what it is, and also see that today, um, what ha Israel governs through a code in which political status is linked to mobility, right? We think that, that political st status and citizenship is linked to rights. In the Israeli case, it's not. <laughs> I just want to say a little bit about this. I, I, I think it might be useful to understand. So in a, in, in a situation where um, there's closure and a permit system that is privileging mobility, you have people that have subjects that have no mobility and no citizenship. These are the Gazans. You have West Bankers that have some mobility and do not have citizenship and they don't have the possibility for political participation in the government that rules, rules their lives. You have residents of East Jerusalem who have some sort of political status, they're residents and not citizens, and some sort of mobility. And then you have Palestinians, Palestinian citizens of Israel who have citizenship and some mobility, and yet their citizenship does not allow them the participation in government as we've seen recently in elections. And then of course you have this gradation of citizenship also within Jewish Israeli society. I think are looking at this, the system of mobility and how it affects political status and how it affects political outcomes and understanding that the removal of the mobility restrictions is the promotion of democracy is what will allow political participation, means we need to center on the siege of Gaza as an example for how destructive mobility restrictions are for any type of political solution. And I think changing our view from looking at actors and what their interests are and how do you negotiate with these and that, yes, that's useful and it's helpful and I learn a lot from it as well. Um, and there's, there's so much work that's been done that I think can, can help uh, uh, make change. But what needs to change, first of all, is our perspective on mobility and the centrality of it um, to uh, everyone's operations and, and also to the position in front of those that are currently um, in, in power in, in the Israeli government and its different organizations. If I could just touch on the security issue a bit further. Um, Israelis in particular, but also the international community often takes it as read that these movement restrictions are based on genuine concrete security concern. And you've already discussed that to some degree. And of course, there's a real tension between the positions that are voiced by the Israeli defense establishment, which you know we often end up finding are unlikely allies in some ways, because they tend to advocate for easing for the hum easing the humanitarian situation and the closure versus the rhetoric of cabinet members who tend to support more aggressive military tactics, the tightening of the closure. So how do you see the relationship between security and the closure of Gaza? And do you also get reactions like we do at Yisha and other NGOs that you're calling by the undermining of security? And, and how do you address that criticism? Thanks. 
Yeah, um, that was actually my first question. Like, I was really interested. I wanted, you know, I wanted to understand, like, how does this work? Is this, you know, as a sociologist, you, you really want to know how does the mechanism work? Why, you know, why are things built as they do? And what was shocking to me was actually to see the way, as you said, the people in the civil administrations are the one, uh, the one saying, you, ne you need to ease the restrictions, the restrictions are bad for us. Um, and then you had what I, you know, the way I saw it, and this is about the West Bank, it's less about, about Gaza. Um, I saw the, um, the Shin Bet, the, 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 the Secret Service, move from a position of recommendation about security into a position of basically calling the shots and being the organization that classified population through a lens of security for its own needs. And what happens is when there is a lack of leadership, the first thing um, that, that leadership refrains to challenge is the issue of security. And in Israel, one of the, the, the one of the tactics that, that you would hear all the time is that, and this is this is like the heads of the civil administration. This is sometimes people inside of the of the security apparatus that are questioning policy. And when they would question policy, uh, the 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 answer back to them would be, well, do you want to take responsibility for the next bus that blows up? Which stifles the conversation and doesn't allow any going forward because everyone is so afraid to move. Now, what that does is also means that you cannot question the structure of the social field which is being discussed, right? We can't question it. This is about security and then everything else is kind of catered to that. And the, 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 the question, what is security? What promotes the security of Israelis, of Jewish Israelis? No, that question is not asked. It's taken as a given that mobility restrictions, separation, segregation, the wall, military rule, and having your knee on the necks of millions of people is security, which we know <laughs> historically that is completely untenable and unsustainable. So not only is the, are the practices themselves not questioned, but um, the apparatus itself. Now they are deeply questioned in internal conversations. And this is one thing that, that I think a lot of us have, have noticed, right? When people leave their jobs in the security apparatus, suddenly they're willing to talk about this, but they're in this vortex, which they, they so any challenge that what Israel is doing is because of security and not because of control, um, is scary to people because they, you know, they, they get called out for, are you, do you, are, are you gonna, do you want to take responsibility for this? You know, are you not loyal enough? Are you a traitor? I mean, it, it's, it's this whole, um, loyalty and suspicion, um, access that, that goes on within, uh, the internal apparatus. But what you see, and this is something that I'm sure that Gisha know a lot about, Sometimes people from the civil administration would ask the, 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 the people from the kibbutzim surrounding Gaza to make requests to have workers from Gaza so they could release the pressure. So, and I've, and I've heard this time and again, and you know, it's, it's kind of shocking, right? You say to yourself, wait a minute, you are the people in power, why aren't you doing it? They feel that they are caged within this structure. So, in a way, I think that one of the things that might free the people inside of the, the apparatus of the bureaucracy of the occupation to speak their mind and to make the policy recommendations they think might really work and be beneficial would be if instead of catering and taking for granted that when, that when, <laughs> when Israeli officials say security, you're gonna just take that as a face value to challenge that, ask how political it is, ask what this, ha what this has to do with, with political structures. This is a tough thing to do. It's obviously very intimidating. Also because many times 
as lawyers, as, as human rights workers, as diplomats, you're approaching and you have something in mind that you want to achieve. You just want to get it through. You want to get a family through. You want to get a cancer patient through. You want to have X amount of people working again. There's all these things that, you know, you have humans in front of your eyes and you want to, and you want to see, um, and you want to achieve that. But in a way, understanding, and this is something that I think, uh, um, Taufik uh, Haddad, uh, he, he makes a wonderful argument and he, he says international organizations are the ones that legitimate the depolitization between the political organizations, you know, between the politics and the security. This is not a technical issue. We have to talk all about it. Do mobility restrictions work? The, the, the short answer is no. I'm totally willing to go in and battle that. That's um, literally um, what I tried to do in the book. But um, um, yeah, Happy thank you so working. much, Joel. Um, that was very, very interesting. Um, and so now I'm going to move towards Natalie, um, who I suppose somewhat represents or at least can provide some insight into the kind of international perspective on this and the international community policy perspective. So I kind of want to start with quite a broad question, which is about the idea of the two-state solution. Of course, analysts have been sounding the death knell of the two-state solution for many years. The threat of formal annexation earlier this year only intensified those warnings. But now that formal annexation is off the table, at least for the time being, it seems that there's a real risk that the international community sinks back into this kind of deadly passivity, the stasis that we've been seeing for a number of years. All the while Israel entrenches the status quo or potentially even goes beyond the status quo, as we've been seeing recently with the moves towards normalization, the UAE deal and the cascade of you know, steps towards normalization we've seen since then. All the while the chances of peace are growing ever more remote and the separation of Gaza is being entrenched. So, of course, EU policy is predicated on the idea of a two state solution. If that's no longer possible, um, and that, of course, is, is a question. Is it time that the EU actually overhauled its policy position towards the Middle East peace process as a whole? And also, what about its policy towards Gaza now? Well, thanks, Beth. And uh, I, mean, I think that the risk is a much, a far more serious risk than one of passivity. Uh, I think that the risk is one of going, of, of re-becoming very active, but in a very different and, and counterproductive way. Now, I mean, I think you're very right, you know, sort of pre the whole sort of annexation saga, we've been in this uh, state, this kind of, you know, inertial passive state of basically uh, seeing on the one hand the entrenchment uh, of occupation that uh, in different ways, both the beer and, and, and Yale, I think, described in a very powerful way. Um, but in a sense, particularly over the last decade or so, um, the whole region was on fire and therefore attention was distracted elsewhere. And yes, indeed, the occupation is there and, and Gaza is there, but you know, um, let us keep on talking the talk of the two-state solution and, uh, and perhaps at some point that talk is going to uh, sort of, you know, uh, materialize into something, into something more. Then comes the whole sort of threat of annexation. Uh, which, for reasons that you know we all we all know, and I won't get into, uh, has now assuming that it ever really was uh, a threat, uh, has in any case now been uh, sort of you know that, we, that there's been a step back from the brink. Now, I think the risk that the international community, beginning with the European Union, is in now is that of not simply rewinding back to where we were six months ago. Uh, but it's basically that of saying, hey, this is a real achievement. The fact that there has not been annexation uh, is a real achievement. And in fact, what we have to do is reward Israel uh, for this big achievement. Uh, and I think this is where we are now. Uh, and I think this is where we ought to sort of focus our minds, because I think this, as I said, I think this is a very real risk. So I think it's worth sort of reflecting uh, a little bit as to, as to where we actually are. So firstly, to what extent was the annexation a threat? I mean, obviously it was in all sorts of uh, legal ways. It was perhaps slightly less in, uh, in, in practical ways for reasons that uh, I think people uh, living in, in, uh, in, in the region can understand far, far better than, than I can. Um, but in a sense, it had inbuilt into it 
uh, I mean, it may sound a little bit obscene what I'm about to say, but just kind of you know, sort of follow through the logic of it, an opportunity. And the opportunity was that of uh, shaking the international community out of that inertia uh, that we've been in. Uh, and therefore basically saying, well, you know, the two-state solution has been a wonderful idea, but, uh, you know, we really did believe in it, but obviously Israel did not. Uh, and this is the sort of tangible proof that it did not. And therefore we had, no matter how much we, um, you know, we dislike the situation, we're forced into a, you know, we're, we're sort of obliged to think about alternatives. So we're, at the very least, we're obliged to think, which is already a starting point. And obviously, now that that threat is not there in the same way, there is a tendency to sort of uh, go back to where we were. So in a sense, there is, on the one hand, this question of an opportunity, quote unquote, which, which has been missed. On the other, there is the question of to what extent uh, has there actually been an achievement? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, uh, obviously sort of, you know, opening diplomatic relations between countries uh, can always and necessarily be seen as a good thing. This is what diplomacy is there for. Uh, you have diplomacy precisely because there are all sorts of problems to, to resolve. Um, and this, by the way, should also be something, you know, to, sort of to make the Gaza parallel here, precisely because there is the perception of a problem in Gaza. This is precisely why, you know, the sort of whole non-recognition policy, for instance, was such a terrible mistake. So, you know, obviously it's not, Natalie, that we'll be saying that opening relations between Israel and the UAE or Kosovo or Serbia or what have you is a bad thing. But I think it's worth reflecting to what extent it's actually an achievement. Um, I mean, it you know, we're not talking about relations being opened or relations being normalized between countries which were at war. Uh, they were not at war and therefore it is not peace that has been achieved. And so I think it's important to put all this in perspective. And, and again, you know, sort of shake ourselves out of our European comfort zone in simply stopping at the assessment of saying, well, this is a great thing and actually a bad thing has not happened and therefore a reward has to ensue. I think then there is a real danger uh, and, and you know beyond the question of what is the reward that we're actually talking about whatever you reactivate the EU Israel Association Council I mean you know, there are all sorts of ways in which rewards can be given but I think probably the most serious uh, risk the extent to which this will be materialized will obviously depend on not so much what happens in Europe but what happens on the 3rd of November in the United States is that of uh, in a sense, the sort of very instinctive diplomatic, if you like, mindset parallel being made between there is the threat, sort of an averted threat of annexation, which opens the way back into diplomacy, uh, translated into a Middle East peace process. Now, there are all sorts of ways why that transition is a problematic one. It becomes all the more problematic if the interpretation of that Middle East peace process is anything uh, to do has anything to do with a revitalization of the Trump plan, uh, which of course is the real risk of, in a sense, you know, the UAE Israel normalization, uh, you know, beyond on the one hand, not necessarily meaning great things uh, because there was not a war between the two countries. Uh, but, but the real risk is that of revitalizing something that was dead in the water, i.e. the Trump uh, plan. Uh, now, obviously, that risk is all the more concrete in the event of a uh, victory of uh, Trump on the 3rd of November. Uh, but even in the event uh, that this will not happen, even in the event of, of a Biden administration, there is an element of risk of appropriating some of the aspects, some of the philosophy embedded into that plan into any attempt at revitalizing a process. And the process and the problem as far as Europeans are concerned is that, as I said, there is a very instinctive sort of knee jerk uh, assumption that talks are good that annexation is bad, that the two-state solution in words is good. So that the sort of talking the talk uh, is what is, is necessary and, and having averted this, the sea danger, as I said, it's, it's more than simply a danger of, you know, a risk of going back to passivity, but rather actively uh, sort of moving back into a mindset which has obviously in many respects taken us exactly where we have been, uh, where we are now. And what could a reformulated EU policy actually look like and how can it bring Gaza into the equation as well? 
Well, I mean, you know, here I think that the, um, and I think this connects in many respects to, to the points that both Yale and, and, and Abir were making earlier, which is really this question of, uh, of rights and where, where, where one must keep um, the, 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 I mean, what is the ball <laughs> where our eyes must, must focus on? Uh, and there is indeed the sort of um, tendency to assume that focusing on rights is somewhat something that is indeed important, but it distracts attention. Uh, from, from the political, uh, especially when that political is translated into a political process, which is translated into a Middle East peace process, which has the connotations that uh, we, we, we know uh, all too well. Um, rather than actually saying, well, hang on a sec, the constitutional end point of all this is, is obviously important, but it's in many respects actually secondary. What is primary, what has to be the priority, is the rights question. Uh, so when it comes to, to movement, it is the, uh, the uh, to, to Gaza, it is the movement question. Uh, when it comes, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which the, the rights question, um, you know, one can give a concrete meaning to, to, to the rights question. Uh, but in a sense, that requires sort of refocusing attention away from the grand framework, uh, which inevitably gets us bogged down into how many states there are going to be and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to the basics, which are not only important today and tomorrow, but which ultimately are the stuff <laughs> uh, through which any con any sustainable constitutional endpoint is going to be made of. No, I can't hear you. I'm on mute. No, I'm unmuted. Um, and then the question of how EU policy may have actually inadvertently kind of fostered some of the political drivers of the conflict. So if we think you mentioned the no contact policy, um, how, how may EU policy have inadvertently actually entrenched the separation of Gaza from the West Bank and maybe kind of prolonged this conflict in a sense? Well, I mean, yeah, I think in sort of probably two very obvious uh, ways. Uh, I mean, you know, first is the whole sort of non-recognition non uh, policy, which uh, by definition, it entrenches a policy of separation. If you recognize the authorities on one side and you don't recognize the authorities on the other, uh, by definition, you are, uh, you are conducting, you are entrenching. In fact, you're even driving uh, a policy of, of separation. And then secondly, and connected to this, uh, is, 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 the, is the link between the sort of uh, the, the political and the rights question and, and the... And, and the uh, if you like, the conflict question with the democracy question. Uh, and in a sense, uh, EU policy towards Gaza has in a sense been reinforcing the de-democratization trends both in Gaza as well as in the West Bank, uh, both of which obviously being drivers, uh, although not primary drivers, which of course has everything to do with Israel's occupation, but certainly secondary drivers uh, to the entrenchment of the conflict, I would say. Thank you, Natalie.